Talk Celestial Clock. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. We've been looking at Jupiter's location in the hind foot and here is where it is on the 13th from Jerusalem. So still well within the hind leg, particularly even the right leg of the lion. And even on all the celestial charts that we've seen, it's still in the leg of all four charts. It is well understood and well demonstrated that this area is the hind leg and we know that for sure. And we've been looking on the radar and kind of laying out getting an idea of how the celestial clock lines up with where we are right now. The enemy knows this time is very important. They've been working toward this time for over a year and we've detailed a lot of that before. But we see a culmination of a lot of the signs we've seen over the past year coming together right now. Also pulling together the tapestry of redemption as well. The enemy knows what time it is. There's a lot of messaging to this time as well that they see because they are familiar with their version of the lion and the story that he's been weaving, which is a close counterfeit, by the way, because he is a counterfeit. And it's just interesting to know that the roaring lion fire is still going on. It's 65% contained right now, but that's still going on in the news still, along with the Olympics and all the other lion push that they've been putting out lately and pulling together from activities that they've had months ago, pulling it all back and rehearsing it now. They've been preparing for this time. We have been watching for this time over the past year, watching everything come together too as well. And right now we see Jupiter's visibility getting less and less every single day. And by September 2nd, that is the expected Feast of Trumpets Day on the calendar that we've been looking at, the one that actually lines up with the agricultural cycle in Israel like it's supposed to. So that is the expected start of the seventh month, which would start the new civil year, which is typically associated with the end of the Jubilee year. Now the Jubilees are announced at the Day of Atonement, but the actual civil year, which is equivalent to the financial year too as well, that starts on the first of the seventh month. And there are differing opinions about does it start on the first day, does it start on the tenth day, does it start after the next day. If you ask ten different people, you'll get about fifteen different interpretations. But we will go with the consensus view that it starts at the first of the seventh month. Regardless, it's going to be happening in a few days after that. Anyway, all we know is we are approaching the close of a very important year, which there is expectation of prophetic events happening for Israel too as well, them getting their land back potentially. Since the beginning of this civil year, there's already been an expectation of prophetic major events happening this year too as well. And so here we are finding ourselves at the close where this Jubilee year is wrapping up. And so we already have an expectation just from that, that major things, major thresholds are about to take place. And if you haven't yet, definitely check out our infographic, Biblical Prophecies of the Middle East, which covers and explores some of the possibilities of what will happen prophetically as soon as the Antichrist is unrestrained and as soon as prophetic events start rolling. But it appears those events won't be triggered until the rapture takes place. And we've been looking and watching and trying to get a better understanding of the celestial clock right now and how it is ticking down and we've seen different chiming times drawing our attention to different aspects along the way in our journey. And that's what's been so amazing about this journey is the different areas where we've paused and had different expectations. We've learned something that's added to the tapestry of redemption that we've been looking at. Over the past year, the year and a half really, we have not had to throw everything away and go back to the drawing board. No, that's the amazing thing about this is because we keep going forward in faith and exploring what God is showing us, particularly with the celestial signs, it just keeps adding and adding to the story. We keep seeing the tapestry of redemption being woven. If we gave up when we were disappointed or got miffed earlier, we would miss so much of the story that keeps getting better and better. And so right now we find ourselves in the green area. It's the 13th right now. We are in an area that up through the 19th, one can demonstrably say we are within the hind feet of the lion concept. Demonstrably. We can show you charts. We can show you historical documents. You can easily make a court case that, yes, we are in the feet of the lion. And this is not hard to verify. You spend five minutes on Google looking for antique star charts with Leo. And you'll quickly find that the majority of them are all consistent, particularly with the hind leg. And we've shown that too as well. And the concept of Virgo comes very close. There's a lot more variation in her depictions, but her head comes close, but doesn't quite always touch. There's usually a gap. There isn't an overlap. We've seen that in Exhibit C and in Exhibit D too as well. And you'll see it in similar ones too as well. It's normal for her head to come very close to the crook of the lion's leg, but there is no overlap. 
but it is so easily demonstrable. This is not hard to find out that, yes, it's still in the hind leg. There's almost no dispute about it. And you can go to the Louvre. Museums, major museums that have hieroglyphics in them. The Dendera Zodiac, the hieroglyphs there of their understanding of the stars back to the time of Christ and even of the wise men too as well, well understood the concept of the lion and how his posture was. And so this is not hard to find out. So we can easily, demonstratively prove that we are in the hind leg. In fact, you can't prove that we're not in the hind leg because the star chart, so we are there. And when we combine the historical and the technical and the conceptual, we get a clearer view of the celestial clock of the patterns and shadows in the signs that are in the lights in the firmament being rehearsed right now. But after the 19th, it starts to get very hard to make a case because the consensus of the celestial charts show that Jupiter's location would be in the hind foot up until this area. Then the evidence starts dropping off real quickly after the 19th. And you're going to be really searching for oddball celestial charts to prove it after the 19th. So, so we got a strong case up through the 19th, and then it starts dropping off really quickly. And so that doesn't mean Christ will come on the 18th or 19th. If anything, we should expect him to come while the case is very solid. And you could definitely say that absolutely, it's not at the edge of a concept or even all the concepts. It's well demonstrably within the hind feet. And we're there right now at the 13th, and we'll still be there for a number of days still too as well. But after the 19th is when you start running into a gap. And I call it an arguable gap because it varies depending on star charts, because Virgo's depiction varies a lot more. Leo's leg is almost consistent in all the charts we've seen. Virgo's changes a lot more as her head flops around, depending on the different artwork. But there is a recognized gap between the two, and so there is a fuzzy area where one can't make a case that it's necessarily in the hind legs, but not necessarily in Virgo either. That's an arguable time right there where you can't make a strong case either way. But on the 26th is when Jupiter would enter within the stars most recognized with the constellation stars that go with the woman. The concept of the woman, even the top of her head there. So by the 26th, you can't make a case that it's in Judah anymore or in the hind legs because you can show on any celestial chart that it is in Virgo. Where we are right now is a peak window. Any day now is very strong. And so, of course, that means by the Feast of Trumpets, which is expected to be on September 2nd, that Jupiter would well be within Virgo at that time, several days within Virgo at that time. So we're definitely not looking at the Shiloh sign by then either. So we see that this year is wrapping up on the civil calendar and the Jubilee calendar too as well. So prophetic events are already expected from that. In addition to everything else that we're looking at, but Christ told his disciples that he would be coming during the days of Noah and Lot when people would be living as though life goes on. There would be no major disruption. There won't be World War III breaking out. There won't be economic collapse at that point. When Christ comes back, it will be suddenly and out of the blue. People will have no expectation. There won't be any major disruption of the general life. And so we find that right now, but we find the window where other major prophetic events are expected to happen. We see ourselves on the threshold of those too as well. So we keep that in mind in addition to the Shiloh prophecy that time is running out on multiple indicators. And we're reminded of the sun entering Leo too as well, a picture in rehearsal of the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And that is who we're expecting right now. We have heard the trumpet call that the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And now we have this picture rehearsed for us too as well. At the same time that the Shiloh sign is fully engaged, demonstrably in play. At the same time we are in the month of Elul, connecting I am my beloved and my beloved is mine, our Redeemer. And we are expecting the gathering of his beloved, the harvesting of his beloved. And we see the picture right now as Jupiter is in the hind leg in this month of Elul, connected with the harvest. We see the bridegroom picture being rehearsed on top of that, that he is coming out of his chamber. Now the sun entered Leo technically on the 11th. And when we look on Stellarium on the 13th, we could see that it's very close to the actual stars of the recognized part of the constellation, the actual lion. And in 14th, it's going to be getting closer. And 15th, closer. 16th, closer. And about now you could make an argument even that it's in the conceptual paws of the lion too as well. And 17th and 18th and 19th. So it's just interesting to see how the picture of the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and how it is overlapping the picture of the lion of the tribe of Judah at the same time is so amazing. 
So then the 20th and the 21st, we have multiple lights in the firmament reenacting different parts and rehearsing different shadows and patterns for us, bringing together a story. And as we watch over time, we see this play of this story of redemption being rehearsed in the heavens for us. So again, this is where Jupiter is right now, well within the hind leg, demonstrably on all the celestial charts that we've looked at. We are in a very strong time right now and for a few more days going forward. I've created a new folder on our Google Drive called Gathering, where I've been putting documents from our latest videos so you can print them out for your reference. And so definitely check it out. Just extra things you can print out and study and be reminded of and put on your refrigerator, different timelines. We are all watching together. That's what we're watching. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I don't even know all the questions either, but we are all watching together because we are looking for our bridegroom. He has told us when we see things coming together on the prophetic scene, we should be looking. We should be looking up at the celestial signs. He tells us to look, and he tells us we will be able to tell that he is nigh even at the doors, but we're going to have to study it. We're going to have to watch it. We're going to have to figure it out. We're going to have to look at this story that is being rehearsed in the heavens. He doesn't come out and plainly say, you're going to see such and such in the sky. No, he just says, you will be able to tell that your redemption draweth nigh. And the more we are familiar with the story of redemption, the tapestry of redemption, and the story of Shiloh, and all that he has done for us, the more we are familiar with that, and then we start studying the celestial signs and how they portray that story. And we bring all this information together and we study. We can start to see this play in the celestial lights in the heavens. We can start to see an idea of what time it is. We can start to see the story of our redemption drawing nigh. We can tell what time it is when we watch. It's not going to be an instant knowing the story. We're going to have to watch. We're going to have to study it. It's all going to take time. You know, even the wise men, someone commented recently, even the wise men had to stop and ask directions. I don't pretend to have all the answers. You know, we've gotten off course a little bit here and there, but the story hasn't changed. When we find out that we're off course, we correct it and we look back what we're supposed to be looking at. This is a learning journey. We are learning together. We are watching together. We are looking for Shiloh. We see so much coming together. We know it is around here somewhere. And God delights in seeing us eagerly anticipate his arrival and trying to understand the treasure map that he has left for us. And so we are going to continue to watch. We're going to, have to be sober. We're not going to quit when we get disappointed. We're going to have different times of expectation along the way. And we've had those and we've learned a lot at those points too. It's been amazing coming together. But we keep going forward in faith because we know he is showing us something. And it is around here somewhere. So the more we watch, the more we learn. And the more we watch, the more God gives wisdom and insight to an understanding of the times and an understanding of the celestial signs. And we can see more of the story that is being rehearsed for us, painting a beautiful picture that goes beyond just words. He's painting a picture that speaks a thousand words of Shiloh, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, coming to gather his beloved. So we will continue to watch. We will be wise like the wise virgins. We will watch. And we have been watching the celestial signs for over a year now. Going back to the blood moons, a lot of people were focused on those and a lot of people read into them a little bit too much. And I was telling people even then that they are indicative, they are a warning, they catch our attention. And it does seem that our attention is being drawn to the prophetic time and events that are about to happen in Israel. But they aren't prescriptive. They are indicative, but they aren't prescriptive. But the unique celestial events of the blood moons definitely caught our attention because of their rarity and in their connection with Israel and other events and just them being rare celestial events too as well. Caught our attention, particularly when we already know we're at the end of the last generation and nearing the end. And at the same time as starting a new jubilee year too as well with the last blood moon. So we took note of the celestial sign. We didn't know exactly what it meant. But we studied it, and we thought about it, and we observed it, and we noted it. And this is what we have to do. Make note of things, and as we go forward, we will start to see how the puzzle pieces come together. Now, one thing we did a year ago is we put together a cyclical calendar view of the Jewish month with the calendar that we've been looking at that ignores the rabbinical precepts. And we started just taking a note and making marks of when these celestial events happened. Because we knew they were significant and significant things were happening. We didn't know what the story was. We don't have the clear picture. We learn more as we go forward. We learn more as we study. We learn more as we continue to watch. There are going to be bumps in the road along the way, but we will continue to watch. 
And there were several significant celestial events that happened just within the last year and a half. And so I wanted to plot them out. And so I put it on a cyclical calendar view because the Jewish idea of time is cyclical, especially when you do properly orient it to determining the time from celestial events, then you really realize how time is cyclical. So this is how we laid it out. And you can see how the last two blood moons ended up there was the one that was on Passover, but then the final blood moon happened right after the Day of Atonement, which is interesting. It's timing right near the time when they would be blowing the trumpet to start the Jubilee year. So that caught our attention, and also the fact that it landed between Atonement and Tabernacles. And like we covered in our last video, we are expecting the redemption of the purchased possession, which then goes straight into Tabernacles. So it caught our attention that the blood moon landed right between the two on a celestial based calendar. But then we also noted how the triumphal entry date, which is four days before Passover, is directly across from the Day of Atonement. And the Jewish people even know this of how Passover and the Day of Atonement mirror each other. They go together. And so this is why I wasn't surprised when we saw, like we studied yesterday in Hebrews 9, that when Christ came at Passover, he also fulfilled the Day of Atonement. And you have to keep this in mind all the time. And in the Jewish understanding and Paul's understanding, this was completely logical for the Passover fulfillment to also address atonement because they are mirrored. They're on either side of the calendar, directly opposite each other. The lamb that comes over Passover was also making the payment for atonement. When Christ came as the Passover lamb, he was also coming to pay our atonement, to pay our redemption. He fulfilled both feasts at the same time, and they're opposite each other on the calendar. And so Christ paid our atonement price. He paid our redemption. And that was the first time he came, and we're awaiting for him to come the second time. And right now we're in the Feast of Trumpets with all the prophetic warning and the celestial signs and the sign of Shiloh. All the signs that our bridegroom, who is coming to gather his beloved, is almost here the second time. Remember, he fulfilled prophecy to the day when he came at the triumphal entry four days before Passover. The triumphal entry is directly connected to the Day of Atonement. Both of these go together. And we are awaiting the Lion of the Tribe of Judah to return again and pick up what he has already redeemed. And the more we watched and were paying attention to these unique celestial signs because we knew something was going on, not only with the prophetic geopolitical events going on and with Israel and the last generation, we already knew we should be watching more intently at this time because there was high expectation that things were coming together very soon. And so when we started plotting it out, we noticed that the blood moons lined up exactly with the median average with other significant celestial events too as well where we could tell that these celestial events were not accidental or coincidental. They were being done very deliberately and being done in a systematic way that caught our attention. When we took the median average between the last two blood moons, it caught our attention drastically that there was another blood moon called the American blood moon that happened at that exact point. And this definitely caught my attention. I was outside looking for the star of Bethlehem at that night and the American blood moon caught my attention. I took this picture of it. But that was the same day as the Star of Bethlehem sign. And that definitely caught our attention to be standing outside on the porch looking for the Star of Bethlehem sign, which is already rare, had it happened in 2,000 years. And then just looking over to the left a little bit, you would see a blood moon. That caused some goosebumps to see that. And we knew this was not accidental. It was not coincidental. It was being done deliberately. God was trying to catch our attention. And he was drawing our attention to the celestial clock. That there is something very important about this time that we need to pay attention to because there's warnings and echoes of judgment. But then at the same time, there is the sign on the exact same day in the exact same sky, the pattern of the king coming. Here on one night, we had warnings that judgment was coming, but that the king was coming. And that definitely caught our attention and sobered us up and said, we need to pay attention and we need to start watching the celestial signs and paying attention, making sure we have an understanding of the times because the king is coming. We haven't seen these signs in over 2,000 years. Time is running out. And then when we saw a second star of Bethlehem echo reminder, just a few months after that, that really caught our attention because the original wise men, they saw the star of Bethlehem two instances. And now we've seen the star of Bethlehem in two instances in conjunction with blood moon 
which are connected with warnings of judgment, we were watching and this caught our attention, especially how it was landing at some very significant pattern events and rehearsals of other patterns as well. And this is what it means to watch. Doesn't mean we'll have the whole picture. Doesn't mean we'll be able to tell you the future either. But it does mean, hey, I know something is going on and God is drawing our attention to right now and we better pay attention to the celestial clock. Because there's a story going on here that he wants us to pay attention to. I know that much. So as we started watching and just studying and mulling over the star Bethlehem signs, we were wondering, okay, the first star Bethlehems indicated to the wise men where the king was. And they gave them a pretty good clue that the king was coming and that he was arriving. So if this is a true celestial sign and God is drawing our attention to it with the precision, then we should be able to deduce some similar ideas too as well when we should expect our king to return. And so we noted how the placement of the two star Bethlehems on a cyclical calendar were largely on one side. And so we automatically started looking, okay, what's on the other side? What is in the future from these two star Bethlehems? Is there a significant pattern? Is there a significant shadow pattern? And it caught our attention that Purim was directly in the opposite direction. So we broke out our T-square and we figured out, okay, what is the median average between these two star Bethlehems? And we were very surprised to see that it landed square on Purim. Not one day or two days off to the other side, directly on Purim. The median average between the two star Bethlehem signs. That definitely made us sit up in our chair of, whoa, okay, bride who goes to the king's house. It's all about a queen being prepared for a king. That's what we're expecting. That's what the star Bethlehem is all about too, a king coming. That definitely caught our attention. And we were reminded of Esther 2.8, how it talked about how she spent a year divided into two parts, six months of preparation and six months of purification. She was given a year to prepare for going to the king. And she was given gifts that she needed to prepare herself, instructions of how she should prepare herself, what she should do, others to help her. But she had 12 months divided into two portions of preparation and purification before she went to the king's house. As the church, collectively we are the bride, but individually we are the bridesmaids. And just like the bridesmaids helped the bride get ready for her wedding day, that's our job too. Hebrews 10.24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we see that our redemption draweth nigh, as we see that our king is drawing nigh, as we can tell by the celestial signs that he gives us, that the lion of the tribe of Judah is about to gather his people, we should be more concerned with helping each other get ready by encouraging them unto love and encouraging them to good works. That is what we are told to do. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. We will see the day of our redemption drawing nigh if we are paying attention and if we are shining bright and if we are staying awake. If we are wise, we will know what time it is because we are watching and we will know that we should be preparing ourselves. We should be purifying ourselves. We should be making ourselves ready to go to the king's house. And so at that time when we saw all this coming together, we put together our booklet Exodus 2, The Bride Goes to the King's House, because we saw the deliberate pointing to of this major shadow pattern and in connection with signs that the king was coming. So we definitely sat up in our chair and paid attention. This is the time of our purification, the time of our preparation for our king, for our beloved, for our redeemer. So definitely download this booklet. We still have it in our Google Drive. All of this stuff that we have seen and studied is still valid. We just keep building on top of it as we see the tapestry of redemption unfurled even more for us. So definitely download that. And we are reminded of the miracle at Canaan, which emphasizes that there were six water pots for purification. The whole idea of purification goes together with going to a wedding. And Christ emphasized to his disciples the idea that we need to purify ourselves. We need to constantly check our lives to make sure we are clean, to make sure we are ready. We should be the bride making herself ready for the bridegroom. 
And our study at Purim, which is on the far left of this tapestry here, kicked off a whole lot of other study because we were watching. There is so much we would have missed if we weren't watching the celestial signs, if we weren't even paying attention to the proper time, which would have alerted us to the symmetry of all the celestial signs in the first place too as well. It all goes together. Understanding the time is so important to understanding the lights in the firmament, the signs that they have, the seasons, and what time it is. And the more we started looking at Purim and drawing closer to Purim and that time, that's when we noticed, oh wait, Jupiter is right in Leo, which is a whole picture of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. And that's when we were just shocked and amazed. And we started to see the picture of this Shiloh prophecy coming together and realize that a tapestry was being woven before us. Patterns and shadows were being rehearsed for us. A story was being told and we were reminded of our beloved, our Redeemer, and that he was coming to gather his people. We don't have all the answers, but we continue to watch. And the more we watch, the more we're given wisdom and insight. And we see that this is an amazing time that has been built up to over the past year of God drawing our attention that time is running out. And it all goes back to understanding the celestial signs, understanding the celestial time, and understanding the celestial seasons. We are watching together so that we all can have a better understanding of the times so we can see our redemption drawing nigh and understand that he is drawing nigh and make ourselves ready for when he gets here. Several weeks ago, on June 30th, we came to the one-year anniversary of the star at Bethlehem. And so we had expectation. We were looking at that time. We're all watching. We don't have the whole story. We are exploring this treasure map, as it were, trying to find our Redeemer. Remember, the parable says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. We're going out to meet him. It's midnight. It's dark outside. So the more we shine bright at this time, the more wisdom we will have in finding him and getting the understanding that we need to find him and get a clearer picture. That is so important at this time to be shining bright because we are going out to meet our bridegroom. It's dark. We're going to be feeling around in a sense, trying to learn more about the signs that he's shown us. And he's told us we'll be able to tell he's drawing nigh. We can tell that, yes. And the more we go forward, the closer we can tell that we are getting to him. It's around here somewhere. And we get more wisdom as we go forward. As long as we don't quit. As long as we keep going forward in faith. Watching. And it's been amazing at every single stop that we've come to where we've had different times of high expectation. We've learned something significant. We've stopped in those areas. We've learned some significant shadow patterns that were at that time. Everything that we've studied along the way has built on top of the tapestry of redemption that we've seen so far. And so we came to the first Star of Bethlehem and the one year anniversary of that. And so we were looking intently at that area because we were familiar with the Esther pattern that was pointed to at Purim in connection with these Stars of Bethlehem signs. So we were wondering, is this the one year pattern of purification and preparation at this time, June 30th? But we also knew in the back of our mind that there is a second Star of Bethlehem sign. So there is another notable anniversary, so to speak. Which one is it? Where is the one year mark? This is what we're wondering. We were shown the pattern. Where is the one year mark? And so obviously we've passed the first Star of Bethlehem anniversary sign. And we can see that the second Star of Bethlehem sign is definitely not going to be in the sign of Shiloh prophecy. It's not going to be applicable at that point. So we know it's not going to be quite there. And when we also think of the wise men, they were most of the way along on their journey before they saw the second star. And they stopped for directions before they saw the second star too as well. And we've had to stop for directions several times. We know it's around here somewhere. We're looking. But I had been wondering for a while, since there's only going to be one notable anniversary of the two stars, it would not necessarily be one or the other. It would be an average between both of those. And when we look at where we are right now, obviously this cylindrical calendar goes back from March 2015 to March 2016. But when you look at the Jewish calendar, which is the innermost ring with the darker colored areas, that Jewish calendar is the same because it's cyclical. It just restarts all over again. So we are here right at this blue tick right now, the month of Elul, day 10. And I was thinking about this more because we are approaching a median point between the two Star Bethlehem anniversaries. When we would be approaching a time that would remind us of both, of what both signified. We would expect there to be one time, one medium point, that would remind us of both. And so here's a close-up view, turned upside down too, so you can better see it. And I colored in the areas with our time frame that we're looking at with the Shiloh prophecy too as well. 
the green goes up to August 19th, so we know the sign of the prophecy is definitely going to be strong within that area. After the 19th, gets real iffy and drops off real quick. And then definitely by the 26th, it's going to be in Virgo anyway by that point. So just ignore the, the dates above that. That's, that's from 2015. But when we overlay it in comparison with the data from 2015, we can start to see some interesting correlations. So if we wanted to find the average median anniversary between these two star Bethlehem signs, that would be a significant reminder of both events, it would be somewhere between the two points. Now we won't be able to give a specific day or hour for it, and so I do want to put a disclaimer out there and make it really clear. This is an average median one year mark. We will not know the exact day. Partly because the Star of Bethlehems had different times when they peaked. They were more than a day, but they had different peak times. And that would depend upon your time zone too as well. So we can find an average. We can get a pretty good idea of when the median would be. But it was still plus or minus a day because of the peak times and the time zones and all that. But we can still get a pretty good idea of when would be a good average median one year mark of the Star Bethlehem signs. Here, a year later, after we were first shown them. And so if we just take the data that initially pointed us to Purim and just get our straight edge and flip it the other direction... It has caught our attention that the median is directly within this green zone that we are in right now. The Star of Bethlehem one year anniversary median average is pointing exactly to where the sign in Shiloh is still strongly demonstrated. Has this caught your attention? It's caught mine. Everything else we've seen has been extremely high precision and we can tell that the lineup is not accidental. It's not coincidental. And all the points along the way have rehearsed important things for us. And again, let me emphasize strongly, this is an average median one year mark, plus or minus a day. Somewhere right in here, before the 19th, we're having a reminder. That's all it is. I can't say this is the day that Shiloh will come back. But we have a very strong reminder that should make us sit up in our chairs right now. That we are reminded right in the middle of where we are right now of the Star Bethlehem signs and the sign of the coming King, our Redeemer, Shiloh, our Beloved. At this point, we are again reminded of the story of Esther and how she purified and prepared herself to go to the King's house. We have that brought to our attention right now again as we are reminded jointly with it of the connection with the coming King, with Shiloh, who is coming to gather his people. And it should also sober us up because it helps explain why the enemy is looking at this time so intently as well. They know the connection about cyclical time repeating itself and the stories of how Purim connects with where we are right now. They know the significance of the Star Bethlehem signs. And if you've been here a while with us, you will remember what we noted was happening at the time of Purim, right around then. That is when they were putting the big push for Leo. And that actually helped us draw attention to the real Leo and Jupiter because we were trying to figure out what in the world is the enemy so excited about all of a sudden. This is what they rehearsed back at Purim, which is the opposite of the time we are right now. And we're at the time where they're bringing that same messaging up again. They know exactly what time it is. And we're just two days past when they released the video game Everybody's Gone to the Rapture last year at this time. They've been using the past year to prepare their disciples to as well. The Bride of Christ should have been preparing herself and purifying herself. Satan's disciples are using that same year to prepare themselves as well. And this is why they're so excited. And we noted back at the time of Purim, shortly after Purim, that they were really emphasizing the rapture game, bringing it up again then, and they were emphasizing how the previous game was Dear Esther. And they were connecting it with the signs that were taking place in Leo with Jupiter right at the hind foot then too as well. But then shortly after Purim, they knew exactly what time it was. And here they are, six months later, putting out an identical messaging that they know what time it is. The sign of Shiloh is in play right now. This is what the clock is showing. Shiloh is about to gather his people. And as soon as he does, the enemy will be unrestrained and they know that. This is why they're looking at the clock. They want to have a understanding of the true clock too. Because they want to know when about they're going to be unrestrained. Neither side knows the exact day or hour. But when we watch and keep moving forward in faith. 
we will see visually that our redemption is drawing nigh. And we find ourselves in a very important time right now that our attention has been drawn to with multiple celestial signs, with multiple shadow patterns rehearsed, a whole tapestry of redemption over the past six months reminding us of our beloved, reminding us of our Redeemer, reminding us of Shiloh, of how he is going to gather his people. It also reminds us of the Esther pattern and the bride pattern that we should be preparing ourselves. We should be purifying ourselves. As a bride of Christ, we should be making ourselves ready and being excited and living accordingly with our heart and life that our bridegroom is returning. And when we look at the calendar and how all these events and the celestial signs and the celestial clock have ticked away at different times, we see six months and six months. We see this Esther pattern and we see it all going with the tapestry of redemption. This is who he's coming to pick up. He's coming to pick up his ready bride, the bride who has purified herself, who has prepared herself, who has made herself ready, who is wisely watching who is going out to meet him, who is actually looking for him, who is actually living for him, right at the same time as a sign in Shiloh, in the month of Elul, which is all about I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine, at the same time that the sun is entering Leo, which is a picture of the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. This is so beautiful, the story being rehearsed in the heavens right now. The celestial clock showing the signs in the heaven, showing the story of Shiloh. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? We find ourselves in an amazing time. The enemy knows it's around here somewhere. They can see the celestial signs. They've been watching the celestial signs. They know our redemption is drawing nigh. Do we know our redemption is drawing nigh? Do we see time running out? Are we rising up? Are we trimming our lamp? Are we making ourselves ready? Jesus Christ rhetorically asked his disciples, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? It was a rhetorical question. He wasn't expecting an answer. But the answer was obvious. He's going to come back and find very few people watching and looking for him. He's going to find more foolish when he comes back than the wise. When Christ came the first time, there was just a handful of people who were looking for him, who were wise and actually rose up and went out to look for him. That was a demonstration of their faith. And Christ told us when he comes back, people are going to be living as though life goes on because they're not watching the signs that he gave. They have no clue that their redemption is drawing nigh because they're not looking up. They're not watching. They're not trying to find out that their Redeemer is coming back. And they will not live accordingly. They will not put faith into action. They will not live accordingly. Friend, what about you? What about me? Are we living wisely when we see what time it is when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in my life? Will he find me living as though he's coming back? This is why we watch. It's not for morbid curiosity. If you're here for morbid curiosity, you're here for the wrong reasons. And you're actually judging yourselves because you are going to be held accountable for the more you know. That's what makes a hypocrite. To know and not live accordingly. And Christ said he's going to leave the hypocrites behind with the unbelievers. That's the exact example he gave in the parable of the wise virgins. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish, they'll trim their lamps for a little bit. They'll run on fumes for a little bit. But they don't want to live in light of his return. They'll give up. We should be looking for the one we love. And I should sober us up that the very first letter he wrote to the church of Ephesus was, You do not even love me. You are doing everything correct, but you do not love me. It is possible to have a head full of doctrinally correct information to know how things should be done, but still not love Christ. Now is when we evaluate our life. What is more important is serving Christ with our heart and life, making sure that we love him, making sure we are near to his side, close to his heart, right near where we can hear him speak to us. If you haven't yet watched our letters to the seven churches, read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and read how many churches were doing things correct, but Christ called them a hypocrite and told them there were things that they need to fix. Now is the time of our purification and preparation. Now, right now, is when we prepare ourselves for our beloved, for our bridegroom. The bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Are you rising up? Are you getting ready? 
when it hits us, what we are expecting. Our Redeemer, our Beloved. Most people get focused on the rapture of an escape to get out of here. Yes, that's great. But are you more concerned about your Redeemer, the one who paid for your sins and died on your behalf? Your mediator who will stand before God one day and testify on your behalf that your sins are paid for? When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are sealed till the day of redemption. And that is what should get us excited, is not necessarily the rapture, not even necessarily going to heaven. But our heart should be rising up for the one who loves us and the one who died for us. Our beloved, our Redeemer, our Bridegroom, who will tabernacle with us one day. That is who we are looking for. That is our expectation. Him. Our eyes should be on Him. This is what makes one wise. When we shine and live accordingly to expecting Him. More Christians are excited about going to the wedding than meeting the bridegroom. The bridegroom is the whole point. And if you do not love the bridegroom, you are not ready and you are not shining bright. What does Christ see in our life right now? What is our light? Is our light what we have in our head, our doctrinal knowledge and how to do everything correct and how to cross the T's and dot the I's? Is that our light? No. The Pharisees had a whole head full of knowledge and Christ called them hypocrites. Because they didn't love God, they loved their religion. They loved the way they were doing things. But they didn't even love Christ. They did not love Messiah. They did not love their Redeemer. They weren't excited at all to see him. You can have a head full of knowledge and not be shining at all. Our light is what other people see in our life. It's not what we say we have in our life. It's not us saying, oh yes, I'm shining bright. No, our light is what other people see. By their fruits shall ye know them. What does the world see in our life? Do we talk like Christ? Do we act like Christ? Do we love like Christ? Is Christ seen in our life? That's the only light that can shine in my life. I don't have any light of my own. Does the world see Christ shining in me? Does Christ see himself shining in the way I live and act? How I serve him with my heart and life right now, that is my light. Not my head full of knowledge. How I live. The fruits I bring forth. What other people see in my life. And as we expect to see our bridegroom now is when we purify our life. Anything that does not shine and show Jesus Christ in our life, we cut it off. We wash it out of our life right now so that we are ready for the bridegroom, so we are shining bright. We are making ourselves ready for our beloved. Now's the time when we need to have a candid oil check. What oil is in my lamp? What is shining in my lamp? What do other people see in my life right now? If you want a candid oil check, don't ask yourself whether you're burning bright. Ask somebody else. Ask your coworkers. Ask your spouse. Ask your friends. They'll give you a candid oil check. They'll tell you how you're shining. They'll tell you how you're living. Why? Because they're watching what light you have. Are we shining for Christ? Or are we shining for ourselves? We live in light of our Redeemer coming. We are called to be wise, to rise up, to trim our lamp, to cut off anything that keeps us from shining bright. And we are told that we will be wise if we go out to meet him with our heart and life. The closer we draw to Christ, the wiser he calls us. The closer we are to Christ, the more we can hear him. The more wisdom he can give us, the more instruction he can give us. The more he can point out things in our life that we need to trim, what armor of light we need to put onto as well. We will be wiser the closer we draw to Christ. We will shine bright when we are closest to Christ. The celestial signs have told us that our Redeemer, our beloved Shiloh, is coming to gather his people. Our Redeemer is coming a second time to pick up what he has redeemed the first time. How will he find us? In what condition are we? Are we making ourselves ready? Will he find us living wisely or living foolishly? Let us be wise. Let us shine bright for Christ, and let us strive to draw close to Him. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Serve Christ, your beloved, your Redeemer, first and highest above all else. Maranatha. Maranatha.